So if Florida State and Clemson are able to get themselves on the move, who needs them more, the Big Ten or the SEC? You are Locked On College Football, your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth. Realignment, coaching carousel, the portal. We've got all that and more every day. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that uh, wants to explore, wants to see what's around every single corner? Well, let me tell you, the Nissan is in indeed the place for you. Go check out Nissan to see what next adventure is around the corner with the Rogue, Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. So plenty coming up. We'll check in in Lubbock, Texas with Texas Tech because you can't sleep on the Red Raiders and three Dark Horse Heisman candidates, all quarterbacks, I don't think that's going to surprise anybody, but let's start with uh, this this ongoing saga, shall we call it, of Florida State and Clemson. Where could they go? Where should they go? And yesterday, Chris Gordy of Locked On SEC had some great insight about you know the SEC's mindset and expansion. They only want to add new states, or they want to you know dilute the payouts for all of their other member schools. And I think that the SEC, as he stated, can afford to be in that position more than the Big Ten. If you're a conference. What are you trying to accomplish? What is your number one goal when making a football conference? Make it as good as possible. How do you know you're doing that? How many championships are you winning? Since the college football playoff expanded to four teams, here are the conferences of the national champions. Big 10, SEC, ACC, SEC, ACC, SEC, 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 Big Ten. The last one, of course, being Michigan this past year. So if you're in the look, if you're Big Ten Commissioner Tony Petiti, you look at that lineup and say, okay, I've got two programs that I know can win the national championship because I've seen them do it in the modern era. And you also bring in a program in or a couple programs that have played at that level, just haven't won in the modern era, right? We've seen USC you know, win a Rose Bowl in 2017, but certainly they were close to being a playoff team the first year with Lincoln Riley. We know that USC can get to that sort of level. Oregon made the playoff, got to a national championship game. Washington made the playoff twice, got to a national championship game. So that's five programs that you can confidently say, I know how they can, I know that they can get to the national championship game. Because if you can do it in a four team, you can do it in a 12 team. Because four team, obviously more selective. And so if you're looking at this from a structural standpoint, you've got five national championship caliber programs in the Big Ten. How many do you have in the SEC where you where you know you have seen it happen or can realistically see it happen because a certain team has come close. How many exist over in the SEC? Well, certainly you've got Alabama. Certainly you've got LSU. Certainly you've got Georgia. Certainly you've got Texas. Because remember, Texas is in the SEC now. And then you've got kind of sleeping giants like Florida, for instance, or Tennessee, perhaps. You haven't seen them get to the upper echelon just yet. But to me, the depth of teams that, if they're at their best, are a national championship caliber, it's stronger in the SEC than it is in the Big Ten, which isn't to say the Big Ten isn't going to be very competitive at the national level. I I fully expect them to be. Everyone expects them to be. But to say that they have the same depth of national championship caliber programs, I don't think is accurate. I think in the SEC, you can make the case for, heck, Auburn won the final BCS or was in the final BCS national championship game. Within the last two decades, they won a national championship. And I didn't even mention them in my initial rundown there. So I think that the SEC's got more programs of that sort of caliber, which is why, as Gordy said yesterday, 
they can afford to be more selective. And I think for the Big Ten, going after Florida State and Clemson should be your priority because the SEC is your biggest competitor. You're not worried about the ACC or the Big 12 or anything else in college football. You're trying to make your league as strong as possible. And if you are able to make the numbers work financially, and I, I think either conference, like it, it's a discussion that has to be had because I don't believe every league in the media contract that they have is, you know, as easy to add teams as it was in the Big 12, for instance, where they said, hey, if you add a power program, you know, Fox will pay a 90% share and ESPN will pay a full share of, you know, what they're paying for all the other teams and such. I'd imagine if you bring in Clemson and Florida State, that are consistently at least inside the top 30 every year in television viewership, usually higher in college football. And that's what, you know, of course, is driving a lot of this. You're going to make it work. You, you, you'll find a way. If there's a will, there's a way. And I think there, there can be a way. So I think that's the upside you're looking at if you're the Big Ten. You say, okay, there's a program that within, you know, since 2010 or whatever, mark, let's just say last 20 years, since, since 2004, there's a program that's won a national championship that just had a 13-0 season, of course, in the ACC. There's another program in Clemson that's won two national championships. And, you know, even if we feel like they might not be exactly what they used to be, we don't know that yet. And maybe you wait and see how this year plays out. Because if Clemson goes 6-6 six and six with Garrett Riley as the offense coordinator and Cade Klubnick at quarterback and Dabo Sweeney's the head coach, that'd be a major red flag. That'd be a major, major red flag in the ACC especially, which is not one of the stronger or deeper leagues. I think of the power conferences, the ACC has the least amount of competitive depth. I think they're stronger at the top with their top three of Florida State, Clemson, and Miami than, say, the Big 12. But I think once you get into the middle, that's where you lean towards the Big 12. I think you can have a lot more teams in the Big 12 this year capable of winning eight to nine games than you have in the ACC. I think that, you know, Duke, maybe, NC State, definitely, Maybe, eh, I mean, I want to say Syracuse with Kyle McCord. I, I just, I don't know. You got a first-year head coach over there. Maybe Georgia Tech, as I talked about in yesterday's show, can surprise some people. But, you know, I, I think that that consensus is pretty understood, at least by some, certainly not by all. But I think for the Big Ten, that's why they need to be prioritizing the move to go get Florida State and Clemson. And I think if you're the SEC you, you can sit back and say, all right, take them. Go for it. I mean, sure, Clemson has beaten SEC teams before, but that was the past. That was the past. That's not, it's not now. That was then, not today. And I think that for the SEC, they don't have a need. I don't think the Big Ten has a need either. But if you're looking at you know who's got a greater need on a scale of 1 to 10, I think the SEC is at about a 2 because – they're already in the state of Florida with the Gators. They're already in the state of South Carolina, granted with the number two program there football-wise in uh, the Gamecocks, but they don't need necessarily to go there. The Big Ten, on the other hand, is not presently. Let me think about it. Oh, yeah, okay. I had to think about the geography for a moment because everything's all mumble-jumbled. The Big Ten has got two teams on the East Coast and neither one of them. Are, are majorly relevant in college football. It's Rutgers and Maryland. When they make a bowl game, that's, oh, hey, nice, good for them. That's that, that's all good and, and, and fine. But I think that's the second factor is why the Big Ten has more to gain adding Florida State and Clemson than the SEC does. Because the Big Ten is, is looking to become the most global conference or the most regional conference, most regionally expansive conference in the country. They already are. They can embolden themselves in that front and have four schools on the West Coast and four schools on the East Coast. And the SEC say, well, you know, we're sitting with our Southeastern-based geography here, and we're fine with that. And we've still got as many national title-capable programs as you do over there. And so it's felt like the Big Ten and the SEC have been working together on a lot of these issues, or at least, you know, with that exploratory committee and how do we fix this problem and that problem and everything like that. But it feels like they've been working towards, yeah, no, everything's consolidating into these two leagues. At some point, at some point, again, it's going to become whose conference is better. And you want to be on top. You want to be number one because that's where there's the most money to be made. And everybody's always loyal to the bottom line. Let me know your thoughts in the YouTube comments. I know you probably will already. Do you know how favorable Texas Tech schedule is next year? 
Do you know why their win total is eight and a half? I'll tell you why after this. This episode of Locked On College Football is brought to you by the spring cleaning champions, Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below the waist grooming. Clear out that winter brush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com, use code Locked On for 20% off plus free shipping. Their products are great. After using Manscaped, I can finally say I've caught the spring fever. Introducing the season's champ, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Features dual LED spotlights to guide you through the darkest winter debris. Navigate with confidence in your delicate areas. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants to get you going. Again, that's code locked on at manscaped.com to get 20% off. This episode also brought to you by our friends over at Better Together. So, collaboration is better than opposition. That's my standpoint, and that's the standpoint at Better Together as well. If your bracket's busted, but you want to stay in the game, introducing Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent, and you can play with your friends, not against them. Pick more or less on real-time player stats, strategize with your partner to boost your odds, and climb the leaderboard together. So grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. Better Together is the first cooperative daily fantasy application. It provides a sense of camaraderie and enhances the social experience of watching sports with your friends so that you're on the same side. Download Better Together now from the App Store. Sign up using promo code Locked On for a chance to win your share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. You can have access to that if you go check out Better Together. Download from the App Store. Use that code Locked On because winning alone is fun, but it's better together. Do not sleep on the Red Raiders of Texas Tech. You can't do it in 2024 unless you'd like to be a fool. Chris Level, co-host of Locked on Texas Tech, joining me here on the show. In, in the Big 12, my mind goes to Utah, goes to Kansas State. That's where the betting markets go as well. And then that next tier of teams, I think, has to include Texas Tech with a 7-6 and six campaign last year on our head coach, Joey McGuire, Baron Morton, a quarterback who we'll talk to a bit later. What's the mood around the Red Raiders football program right now? Yeah, Spencer, I, I think uh, it, it, it was a frustrating season last year. I think you finished it up the right way, but it, it, it was the same thing that we've dealt with in the last, you know, eight out of the last 10 years, give or take, was just too many injuries at quarterback or too many missed games uh, at the quarterback position. And there's some missed opportunities there, you know. Um, and I think that if you can keep – your quarterback healthy, people feel pretty good about what you've got. You've got uh, a guy that's one of the top running backs in the country and Taj Brooks. Uh, they were really active in the transfer portal. And Joey has had these top 25 recruiting classes that he's starting to stack up. And they're still semi-young. This is his third one that he's had. A lot of those guys enrolled early. But you're going to start to see some of that creep into the, uh, the two deep, I, I think, this year. But it's a... Uh, and I think seven home games and five out of the first six, I think, are at home is right. Um, so you got a, a big opportunity to, to get a lot of momentum early on in your season. Yeah, I think that for, for Texas Tech, their schedule is about as favorable as any in the Big 12. And that's certainly one of the reasons that, you know, shows like this one or, or many others talk about the Red Raiders as like, hey, could they appear in the Big 12 title game? Yeah. Yeah, they, they could. FanDuel's got their win total pegged at eight and a half, which is a big, big number for Texas Tech. But when you don't have to go through Texas and Oklahoma and you look at the rest of their schedule, it lines up very well. But, you know, for Joey McGuire, he's going into year three. They had uh, just a one win regression a season ago. He's 2-0 and in bowl games, though, and, and, you know, has done some really, really solid things with the Red Raiders program. But certainly there have been some low moments like losing at Wyoming last year, not a game that... Uh, you know, Texas Tech fans would probably like for me to even bring up. So I'll apologize for that. But going into year three with Joey McGuire at, at the helm, it feels like even if they were to really underperform relative to expectations, his job would be safe. But what is that expectation? Progress. You know, and it's funny, you mentioned, you know, Kansas State and Utah. 
Uh, Kansas, I think, is kind of mentioned by a yep. lot of folks. Is, Oklahoma, you, know, you have to mention Oklahoma State in the Big 12. Yeah, and, and of those schools we just mentioned, Oklahoma State is the only one on Texas Tech schedule. So you miss both Kansas schools. You miss Utah. Uh, you know, I, you do have to play at Arizona. And you do have Oklahoma State. And you've got, you know, your your TCUs and West Virginias, which are kind of in that mm-hmm. that, uh, that meaty middle of, of the Big 12. And I think the Red Raiders are, are, are right there in the thick of things. But expectations here – I think you want to be, and I I probably said this to you before the Red Raiders played Oregon last year, when you and I had a conversation, uh, we were doing on a different show, and and we were talking about something similar, and I think I said to you, you want to be relevant in the conference race into, and and maybe even well into November, because that really sums up, you know, do you have a chance at the conference championship game? Are you already out? You know, what, what's the thought as you kind of end October and you get into November when there's those games are like, okay, we only have two or three left. How important are they? And I, and I, I would say the same thing here, but you just want steady progress. And I just would love to see what it's going to look like if you can keep somebody like Baron Morton healthy and, and allow him. Now, they do have more depth at that position now and, and some more, you know, uh, some more options there. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I do think that it's, it's all about being relevant in a conference race into November and then just showing progress with the program in general. Joey's done a great job here. People are thrilled. They love that he's recruited well. There's a lot of, you know, excitement about the program. They're in the midst of a $250 million renovation to one whole end of their stadium that, you know, they're going to be, that'll be ready for this fall. And so, a lot of lot of uh, excitement about this football team for sure. Now on that stadium renovation, are they going to have like tortillas built into the <laughs> seats? Are they going to like float up where you've got a cup holder? There'll be a, a tortilla holder instead. If I you love know- that you love that. So I, love <laughs> I can't that get enough. Are- I can't get yeah. enough of it, man. I yeah. cannot get enough. I remember when Oregon, you know, had him on the schedule. A friend of mine who was a Texas fan texted me. And he goes, get ready for tortillas. And I was like, what? What? Yeah. He goes, he goes no, 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 no. Literal tortillas. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, watch the game. They have tortillas. When you talk about the best traditions in college football that give it the pageantry and electric nature that separate it, in my view and the view of many others as well, thankfully, from the NFL, Texas Tech and tortillas. There's uh, nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing quite like it. So, I've, yeah, I appreciate that you love it so much. That, that does my. Uh, it, is well yeah, it is well deserved. It is it is well deserved. But uh, another thing that's well deserved for Texas Tech is, I think, the excitement around Baron Morton, who, who's one of the higher quarterback recruits that, that Texas Tech has had. Is, is my understanding? Correct me if I'm wrong there. And he played, you know, over the second half of last year and. Boy, he showed some real, real potential and, and promise. And as spring football gets underway for, for Texas Tech as they go throughout, what do the Red Raiders want to see from their their, their fall signal caller? You, you know, and, 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 and as as he rolled through when he took over and Tyler Shuck was, was injured, Barron basically got hurt. In the game that he comes in for Tyler Shuck, he goes down or he gets hit with a shoulder issue. And so he played – anybody that saw Barron Morton play – he was playing through a shoulder injury, an AC sprain, pretty severe one all throughout. We're talking not practicing Monday through Friday and then just kind of getting through the game and then trying to get ready for the next game by not practicing. Pretty tricky uh, timing and chemistry and all that. He's healthy now. Uh, they've got some weapons. They have one of the top recruits in the entire country who's a receiver out of Lake Belton named Micah Hudson uh, that he's going to get to throw the ball to. Uh, you know, and a guy that, you know, a lot of people on the West Coast are familiar with, Josh Kelly, uh, but Washington State was nearly a thousand yard receiver for for the Cougs. And so he's, he you know, so they've got more speed and, and ability to stretch the field more. But yeah, Barron, he's a dual threat guy, but he'll, he, he want, he's a gunslinger at the end of the day. I mean, he's, he's going to drop those arm angles. And I don't want to say like necessarily like Pat Mahomes, but, you know, he's wearing a Red Raider uniform and Pat was kind of outside the box a little bit. And, he kind of dropped those arm angles because they're both former baseball players. And so, um, but I think there's a lot of, ex- you know, expectations and excitement about Barron. But again, it's all about availability with him. It's the same thing that we said last year about what Tyler w- would have gone through. And when, when they were there, the results were good. But when they're not and you got to go down the depth chart a bit, a bit it's a bit tricky. 
successful head coach going into his third year, promising young quarterback, good recruiting classes, program momentum in general with a schedule that avoids the top three favorites in the conference for the uh, for, for the conference championship, at least according to our friends at, at, at FanDuel. What's a successful season like for Texas Tech? What's a, what's a, what's a good record? I, I think you, you have to get into the eight win territory at least. I think that's what – with seven home games and and not anything on your schedule that you look at and go, oh, that's going to – I mean, you, you know, there's just not a lot there that just scares you. Uh, but I, I think you got to – so I, to me, it would be hitting that over on that on that win total. I, I think if you do that and, and whatever that looks like, I, I would say successful. If you get eight, depending on what it looks like or, or less than that, eh, maybe you left a little meat on the bone. Uh, but again, if you get eight and your quarterback missed half the season, then that, that's, that's got some different context. But I'm going to say if you go over that win total, I, I think you're feeling pretty good about things because that's progress. And I just want you know relevant games in November – as it relates to the conference race with a chance to go to Arlington and play for the Big 12 title. To me, I think you will have uh, you will have done done yourself well if you can say those things. Is the country ready for a 10 and 2 Texas Tech team? We'll just have to find out this fall. Chris Level locked on Texas Tech. Thanks so much. Appreciate you, Spencer. Dark Horse Heisman contenders. Are they on your team? Well, they might be. You're just going to have to stick around. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The North Carolina Tar Heels are the Nissan Armada. This one seed has been as hardcore as it gets all season long, set up that matchup with Alabama in the Sweet 16. The Iowa State Cyclones, they're the Nissan Pathfinder. They created a lane for themselves and came into the tournament as one of the hottest teams in the country. And the NC State Wolfpack, you talk about hot teams, they're in the Sweet 16 after uh, beating our friend Chris's uh, Texas Tech team in round one. Then they beat Oakland in round two for that showdown with Marquette in the Sweet 16. They say win life, go rogue. And that's exactly what the Golden Grizzlies have done here. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop at NissanUSA.com. I have got not one, not two, but three Dark Horse Heisman candidates you should be aware of. Yes, they're all quarterbacks, but guess what? This is, uh, for the most part, a quarterback award. So these are individuals whose odds are outside the top 10 preseason in the country, according to our friends over at FanDuel, and their odds are currently longer than plus 2,000. Let's stop. Let's start with the guy who's right at the top of that list of guys outside plus 2,000, Jackson Arnold at Oklahoma. If you want to talk about a guy who has immense talent, put it on display in a very limited capacity as in you know, one game really last year for the Sooners, but has the opportunity to catapult himself into the Heisman race, Jackson Arnold is absolutely in that discussion. Oklahoma's in the SEC. Their win total, again, according to our friends at FanDuel, is seven and a half which means the expectations for Oklahoma, at least in, in some circles and spheres, are to be a bowl team, to be a good competitive team. But what if Oklahoma is competing for an SEC title? If they're competing for a conference championship in the SEC, which, yes, it sounds weird, but that's the world we've got now, Jackson Arnold's going to be at the center of it, and his production will be directly tied to Oklahoma's success. I don't think that after Brent Venables had a poor defensive year, his first campaign in Norman in 2022 got much better in 2023. If Arnold is a wildly productive quarterback, if he's the same sort of guy that Dylan Gabriel was last season for the Sooners, I don't see how Oklahoma is going under that seven and a half win total, even with kind of a difficult schedule. So if they get into that 10 win sort of range, Arnold is talented enough to put up the numbers that are going to draw your attention where you're going to turn your head and go, wow, he's doing what now? He, he's he's got who's even throwing the ball to Drake Stoops isn't there anymore what what's he got going so behind a new offensive line it's going to be a challenge you got five new starters up front for the Sooners that is going to be difficult especially in the SEC when you go up against teams that have got big time front fours 
it could be a challenge. But if Arnold meets that challenge, you could see his odds get a lot shorter very, very quickly at plus 2200. Next guy, Cade Klubnik. I think Clemson is one of the most interesting teams in college football. I think Nebraska is fascinating. I think USC, who we're going to get to in a moment, is interesting. But I would look very heavily at Cade Klubnik's Heisman odds because this is a guy who's going into not his first, not his second, but his third year of college football because last year was his first full year starting. And the year before that, he played several games. He started in the Orange Bowl against Tennessee. And, you know, that was a year that ah, you can't really expect a ton from a true freshman getting thrown into that spot every now and then when DJ Uyunglele was struggling. The now Florida State quarterback, DJ Uyunglele. Don't forget that. His odds are on here too. I wouldn't go with DJ as a Heisman sort of guy. But for Klubnik, he is going to be able to combine rushing stats and tremendous throwing capabilities. And he's got an offensive coordinator in Garrett Riley, who I expect to have and feed kind of a bounce back year for Clemson. If they're going to get, think about the best Clemson teams. If you think Clemson is going to be an ACC or playoff or national title contender, well, Kate Klubnick is going to have to play at basically a Heisman level. Because when has Clemson been in the national championship discussion? Sure, they made a playoff with Kelly Bryant at quarterback, but primarily when they've been at their best, the system that Dabo likes to run, and also what Garrett Riley was calling with Max Duggan at TCU, who was, you know, a Heisman finalist himself, and I think Cade Klubnik is just as talented as Max Duggan, maybe even a little more, but Duggan was a, Doug, Duggan was a really, really good football player, and we know that. But Klubnik going into year three is going to have to be that sort of guy. Clemson needs, because that's where Dabo has succeeded, to have a quarterback that plays at a Heisman level. Deshaun Watson, Trevor Lawrence, these are the guys who have put Clemson in that sort of position time and time again. And so if you think Clemson bounces back and they can survive in the new world of college football with NIL in the portal where they don't lean into that stuff very heavily, then Cade Klubnik at plus 3,000? Okay. I think that is a legitimate Heisman dark horse right there. So, which brings me to the last one. And I'm I, I guess not entirely surprised, but I'm a little surprised that also sitting at plus 3,000 is Miller Moss at USC. And the, the primary reason I bring up Miller Moss as my third dark horse, dark, remember that phrase. These are guys outside the top 10 odds. The top 10 Heisman odds go like this, just so we're all on the same page. Quinn Ewers and Carson Beck tied for the lead at plus 750. Dylan Gabriel, now at Oregon, got better weapons over there, plus 1,000. Will Howard, Ohio State, also arguably in a better situation than where he was. Not everyone will agree with those statements, but that's okay. Plus 1,200. Nico Iamaleava, there's an interesting pick. Jalen Milrow, Jackson Dart, oh boy, Jackson Dart. Garrett Dutt Nussmeyer at LSU. Connor Wegman, Texas A&M, Riley Leonard, and Cam Ward all at plus 2,000. So those are the top 10 preseason Heisman odds. And look, Miller Moss has only played one game that we all know, the Holiday Bowl against a very good Louisville defense, might I remind you. And I think that his talent is immense. But do we remember who Miller Moss's coach is? Because remember, USC was reportedly in the market for a transfer quarterback, Will Howard. And, and then Will Howard backed off. And Lincoln Riley... It always gets phrased as, well, Will Howard got scared away. But Lincoln Riley's also clearly okay with Miller Moss as the starter because he saw what we all saw and understands, oh, okay, I, I, I can go win games with this guy. I can be productive. I can keep the offense flowing at a level that, that we need it to. And so for Miller Moss, is he going to go for over 400 yards every game? No, that would be absolutely ridiculous. But we know he's capable of doing that against a good defense. And now he's going to have a better defense than what Caleb Williams had this past season. And remember, Lincoln Riley has coached Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, and Caleb Williams to Heisman trophies, and he had Jalen Hurts as a finalist. That's his track record as a head coach with quarterbacks. Not bad. I'm just I'm just saying it's pretty darn good. So when you talk about dark horse candidates in there, how can you ignore the quarterback of an offense that you know is going to be productive on a team that I am perhaps higher on than most? Their win totals fan is on FanDuel is seven and a half. I think they're going over that in a millisecond. All right, it'll take a little bit longer than that, but you get what I mean. I think they're going over that total. They're going to be a good team. I think USC is a dark horse Big Ten contender. 
And I think that Miller Moss is a dark horse Heisman candidate because if you start contending in the Big Ten, it's going to be because of the quarterback. That's where Lincoln Riley, much like the Clemson situation with Cade Klubnick, that's when that program, that team, that coach has been at their best, when the quarterback is thriving. Miller Moss, Cade Klubnick, Jackson Arnold. I would look at all of those guys, young quarterbacks who could be poised for big seasons that include contending for college football's most prestigious individual honor. Because their talent, the production we have seen, I think that you've got a foundation. Now, team success is going to have to follow, but it always does. As Dark Horse candidates, I like all those guys. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.